You say, hey, I, I, I could use the blessing of the Lord, huh? <laughs> well, half of us can, okay? Say, I could use the blessing of the Lord. Anybody say, yeah, that's me. Okay, in all ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, we're talking in this series about awakening in the family. And I want to take a few minutes uh, this morning to talk to you on this subject, forgiveness. I briefly mentioned to you at the end of last Sunday's sermon about an event that took place in 1976 in Chowchilla, California. Three armed individuals stopped a school bus full of children during summer school, ages from about four to 14. They stopped this school bus and kidnapped 26 kids and the bus driver. They had prepared three different vans they blacked the vans out. They put wood all around them so nobody would be able to see that there were children on the inside. They put all of the kids inside of these vans with the bus driver. And then they had prepared a moving trailer and buried it in the ground so no one could see it. And they went to this rock quarry area and they put the 26 kids and the bus driver in that moving trailer buried in the ground with minimal water, minimal food, and put two 100-pound batteries on the opening so they would not be able to get out. I just want you to imagine for a moment the kind of feelings that you would have if you were a five or six year old kid being kidnapped for one and then taken to a place that had no lights. They had one flashlight, very little toilet facilities, minimal survivable food buried in the ground. The kidnappers left and put yourself in the place of a parent when the school bus does not show up. Hey, where's the school bus? It's a little bit late. Ah, they, they probably got a flat tire. As I'm listening to the story, the parents are saying, well, it'll be okay because they had great trust in the school system, great trust in the bus driver, and then it doesn't show up, and it doesn't show up, and then the phone calls begin to start, and the school bus is gone. It's disappeared, and parents are now in panic, and, and in those days, and, and I know some of you would be hard, hard, hard to believe this, there was no such thing as a cell phone. There were these things called landlines. It, it's kind of a, a little box that, that sat either on, on a desk or on a wall, and it had this little round thing on it. It was called a dial. And I don't know if you remember this. I remember this, unfortunately. There was something called a party line. Some of you are nodding your heads like you're, you've just shown me something about yourself. <laughs> And uh, we used to pick it up at the, the house my parents had on the lake. You know, I'm a little kid, right? And so I pick it up and listen to the conversations, right? Because a party line meant that multiple people would use the, the phone, right? And sometimes you would have to get on the phone and tell people, I have got to use this phone. Please get off. <laughs> so, Seriously? Yeah, that's exactly, exactly how it worked. And because there were so many people that were calling in, to the police department and other things, 
the kidnappers were going to call and request their ransom, which in our dollars today was $25 million, but the lines were jammed and they were unable to get through. In the meantime, the top of the moving van began to cave in. And it looked as though that there would be an opening. And so they began to, some of the, one of the older kids that were there and the bus driver, by an act of God's grace, were able to remove the cover that was on the hole. And in 16 hours, those kids were able to get out of the hole in the ground and be rescued. And just put yourself in the place of a family or put yourself in the place of a five-year-old. And the amount of trauma and pain and confusion that comes along with experiencing an event like that. Now, Jesus would say this, and let's key into what he's talking about here. Woe, it's never good when you see that word. <laughs> Woe. <laughs> Woe to the world because of offenses, trouble, pain, hurt. And then Jesus will make a startling statement that we, we don't think ought to happen to us. He said, offenses are going to come. What does that mean? It means that you are going to have the opportunity to become hurt and wounded. There is nobody in this room that is allowed to escape that. We would like to think that somehow we are the exception to the rule. In fact, we are not. There's no one here. You may not have ever been buried in a moving van in the ground as a kid. But every one of us in this room have had something take place. Many of us Ironically, when we were younger, either through a, a family member, a friend, or maybe in our families, once we are married and have children, it is interesting to me, and I think this is an accurate statement, that the family becomes the garden or the greenhouse of what eventually grows in a culture. What do you mean? When we manage relationships in the home properly, then we are able to manage relationships at work. We are able to manage relationships in church, in other locations. But if the relational dynamic in the home is upset, then it will upset every other relationship that you have in any location that you and I have it. This is why when, when you look oftentimes in, in workplaces where people can't get along or, or churches where people can't get along, let's go back to the root. The, the root is not the, the, the job or the boss or the people in church. The root goes way back into our homes in areas where we have not properly managed the offense that came to us. And everybody here is going to be wounded. And, and Jesus says, but woe to the man by whom or through the offense comes. Now, now, the problem is not the offense. The problem is how we manage it. And so Jesus is beginning to teach on this in, in Matthew 18. And then uh, the disciples are listening to Christ talk about this. And Peter will come to him in verse 21, and he was saying to Jesus, how many times then am I supposed to forgive my brother or sister 
who sins against me up to seven times. Now, this is not a random statement because the rabbis in Jesus' day taught that you could forgive up to three times. And all the disciples had heard the teachings of the rabbis. And so when Peter goes to Jesus and he says, ah, oh, Jesus, seven times, he's thinking that Jesus is going to give him a pat on the back and say, you know what, Peter, that's really good. You're extending so much forgiveness, not just three times, Peter, but you're extending forgiveness seven times. That's, that's really good. And, and then Jesus will turn around to Peter and say, no, no, Peter, that's not how this works. You're supposed to offer unlimited forgiveness. <laughs> okay. You hold steady. And Jesus, we're, we're, we're supposed to offer unlimited forgiveness, but you don't know what happened. You don't know what they did. You don't know what was said. So then Jesus will explain this. And he says, therefore, again, let's read through the story in case you haven't read this in, in a while. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. Okay, pause. Jesus is going to now begin to teach us kingdom principles, not American principles. I mentioned to you that, that we don't live in a kingdom. We live in a, a democracy. Well, actually, it's not a democracy. It's really a representative republic where we elect people to represent us. There are kingdoms around the world. Some of them are ceremonial kingdoms like Great Britain, but there are other kingdoms where there is a king. And the word of the king and the kingdom is the final word. And the disciples certainly understood kingdom, because Caesar or the Caesars had the final say. The kingdom of Rome had the final say in everything. And so Jesus is teaching us, let's remind ourselves, he's not teaching us American Christianity here. He's teaching us kingdom principles. Not what we have within our head of how it's supposed to work. This is kingdom stuff. So how many of you are part of the kingdom? Okay. Three people are part of the kingdom. It's awesome. <laughs> it's good. So Jesus is going to teach us kingdom principles here. So he says the kingdom of heaven, not your world, not your kingdom, but his kingdom, because some of us have our own kingdom. Everybody said, ouch. Okay. Not, 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 not your kingdom, but his kingdom is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, the, the amount of this in, in commentators will tell you it's worth anywhere from 12 million to a billion dollars, depending on the weight of gold at the time. Okay, this is a lot of money. Since he was not able to pay, who could pay that? The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Watch this. The whole family is going to get penalized because of the one man's debt. Hold on to this. Don't miss this. So at this, the servant fell on his knees before him and he said, please be patient with me. He, he what? He begged and I'll pay back everything. Here, here, here is one of the most remarkable phrases in all of the teachings of the Bible. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. You owed millions of dollars. Now, how many of you would like somebody to come up to you today and say, mortgage, canceled, debts, canceled, cars, debt, canceled, everything gone. How many like to have everything? Everything's gone. Good. Okay. That's exactly what happened to this man. Okay. Everything was canceled. Verse 28, but when that servant went out, he, and the implication here is that he intentionally went and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, worth a few thousand dollars. In contrast, it was nothing. Notice what he does. He doesn't just have a conversation. Jesus gives the illustration here. He grabs him by the throat and begins to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. Same words, his fellow servants fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it all back. 
Catch the next phrase. He would not. Not that he could not. He would not. He went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged or grieved, pained, wounded. When the other servants saw what had happened, this, this man's actions, remember, did not just affect him. It affected other people. Remember, your actions are not just your own. Everything that we do affects somebody else. And then those servants went and told their master everything that had happened. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured or tormented. Some of your translations will say until he should pay back all that he owed. And, and, and then here's another shocking statement in the Bible. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, what do we learn from this? What, what, what can I gain from this? How, how can I take this and make it relevant to me today? How can we take a kingdom principle from the teaching of Christ then and help us understand how this kingdom principle matters in your own family and your relationships today. Okay, watch this, number one. Forgiveness is not a feeling, but an act of the will. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. Notice this, but he would not. Not that he could not. He would not. A lot of people wait for the feeling. I feel like I want to forgive. Forgiveness has nothing to do with your feelings. And this is where we get messed up because we want to come to a place where we can emotionally grasp the feeling of, ah, I think I can now forgive. Forgiveness is not about your feelings. It's a choice that you make to say, I will forgive. Because until you come to the place where you acknowledge the need for forgiveness, no amount of feeling is going to get you where you need to go. Do we need to pause for a minute and just think about this? I have to make the choice. It's not a feeling, but an act of the will. Number two, withholding forgiveness doesn't just affect me, but others around me when the other servants saw what had happened. I've heard people say before, what I do doesn't bother anybody else. I can do what I want to do and it doesn't affect anyone else. Listen. Who I am internally affects every person externally. Affects my attitudes. Affects my words. Affects how I interact. Affects how I response, respond. This is why an individual who is walking in this challenging issue with someone or something is easily triggered. I saw something this morning, and I don't usually look at social media on Sunday mornings um, because it's rather distracting, but I happened to see it this morning, and it said this, that you are responsible for your triggers, not somebody else, so that people do not have to walk on eggshells around you. Yep. Oh, you can't say that. Don't do that around them. Wait a minute. I'm not responsible for your triggers. You are. That's right. 
And who I am on the inside will eventually affect everyone else around you. Full transparency right now, how many of you have ever gone home before and you don't know who you're going to meet when you get there? What, what do you mean? You a stranger? No, 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 no. You don't know who the person you're living with is going to be when you walk in the house because it changes so often. Withholding forgiveness doesn't just affect me, but others around me. Number three. These are the words of Jesus. The opposite of forgiveness is wickedness. Then the master called the servant in. Here's a painful statement. You wicked servant. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus. I was in church Sunday. I lifted my hands and I praised God and I gave in the offering. I even serve once every six months. <laughs> this is a painful statement when you just sit and read it. You wicked servant. He calls him a servant. But then he says, you're wicked. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Watch this. Unforgiveness results in torment. Jesus said that in anger, his master handed him over. This is an interesting statement. The Lord handed him over to be tormented. The most recent psychological studies tell us that unresolved conflict and unforgiveness affects blood pressure, it affects cholesterol, it affects disease, it affects emotion, it affects health, it affects mindsets, it affects responses. What is going on? The person is being tormented. And they're trying to fix something. I'm all for medication. I, I'm not one of those preachers. You preacher that is anti-medication, okay? But I will tell you, there are numbers of individuals who are trying to fix emotional issues with medicine that have a far deeper issue that they need to deal with. Watch this, forgiveness and the restoration of relationships is the foundation of God's kingdom. Why does Jesus even teach this? This seems too hard, Pastor. It's because everything about God's kingdom is based in the concept of forgiveness. What has the Lord not forgiven you for? Is there anything that you've ever asked the Lord to forgive you for or about, and the Lord said, nah, nah, uh, not today. Everything about the kingdom of God, everything about the cross is about forgiveness. It's the foundation of it. It's the root of it. And that's why Jesus can make the statement, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, one of the individuals who was a child at the time tells his story. And many of those individuals who were kidnapped on that day grew up with nightmares, 
with trauma, with substance abuse, and other things. It was interesting when you, when you listen to the story, they believed that the kids were all good. And at that time in the mid-70s, trauma was not something that was understood very well. They're good. It's all great. And yet they didn't realize how deeply the trauma had affected their lives. And many of them grew up to struggle with things. And this is what he said when you listen to his story. By his own words, he said, and I quote, over the years, there was an anger building in me that infested absolutely every aspect of my life. I was replaying the kidnapping constantly. I wanted to torture those men. I would fantasize about the different ways that we could get them. I was in a prison of my own making. Then I decided to pray. I said, God, forgive them because I can't. Bless them because I can't. And I realized, God, forgive them because I won't. And God said to me, I can work with the truth. We can move on from here. All God wanted was for the man to be honest. Many of us want to come to God with our wounds and our pain and other things and say, God, I'm good, I'm good. And the Lord is like, as though God does not understand or know. So Larry, that's his name, he, he decided to go through something called the restorative justice process where he could gain closure by speaking with his captives. So listen now. This is after 38 years of internal pain and struggle. He went into the prison where the men were being held and he said this, I was your victim for 36 hours and for the last 38 years I have been my own victim. He said, I told them that I forgave them. But forgiving them wasn't enough. I had spent my lifetime hating them. And so I asked for their forgiveness. Now the guy does ministry. Wait, I want you to look at me for a second. There's a lot of people that are doing ministry. I'm not just talking about this, but whatever ministry you're involved in, whether it's helping people in the street or whether you're serving somewhere, whether in your job, because your job is a ministry, you do know that, right? That are ministering out of their own hurt and pain instead of ministering out of the freedom that Jesus is offering them. Because what the Lord is wanting to do is give us freedom or control over that which has controlled us. Here's three things to remember. Forgiveness doesn't mean what the other person did was okay. Oh, if I forgive, it means that, that I, I'm saying, no, it's not what it's saying. It is not to release them from their prison, but our prison. Number two, forgiveness does not mean that trust and relationships are immediately restored. No. 
Sometimes it takes years to rebuild the relationship and the trust. And sometimes it's not possible to rebuild it. That's not the point. And forgiveness can be a journey, but we must start somewhere. Anybody want to start somewhere today? I realized something about a year ago, I guess it was about a year ago, in reading the words of Jesus and how families go from marrying in hope to burying in hate. I'm not talking about in the ground. I'm talking about burying the relationship. Jesus said it years, and in, in, in he's teaching in Matthew 24, and he said it 2,000 years ago, and I saw this process, and I said, oh, he said, many will be offended. This is where it starts. Then if you don't deal with it, it will move to betrayal. Then if you don't deal with that, it will move to hatred. That's always the process. 